In the current election series, we've reached the start of 1918. But to truly understand the politics of that year, it's necessary to talk about the development of the Soviet movement, which will underscore the elections going forward. So consider this an addendum to the election series. Most overviews of Russian history jump to the famous civil war after October and this struggle of reds versus whites. According to the basic narrative, there was a second Bolshevik revolution which took over Russia and ruled the country through Soviets. But then the whites, or monarchists, rebelled against the Soviet government. However, the actual conflict was far more complicated, and there was a prolonged political struggle leading up to full war and concurrent to it, complicating the matter further. This struggle was within the Soviet government itself, a sort of Bolshevik war against the Soviets. This might sound odd, as after all, the Soviets were at the center of the Bolshevik claim to legitimacy. As a quick reminder, Soviets here refer to workers' councils formed during the revolution. These councils elected deputies to higher councils, culminating on the national level at the Congress of Soviets. From the moment Lenin arrived back in Russia, the April Theses had declared the Soviets the only possible form of revolutionary government, and he said that should the Bolsheviks not yet be a majority, or should the Soviets yield to the influence of the bourgeoisie, it was the task of the Bolsheviks to present a patient, systematic, and persistent an explanation of the errors to the masses. The Soviets were the workers organizing their revolutionary government. Thus it was the party's job to advocate for them, to give all power to the Soviets. This idea of the Soviets being crucial both to the revolution and to democracy itself, as opposed to flawed bourgeois democracy, was at the heart of the Bolshevik argument in 1917. To quote Lenin that July, democracy is the rule of the majority. The will of the majority of the workers and peasants, of the overwhelming majority of the country's population, has become clear in more than a general sense. Their will has found expression in mass organizations. The Soviets. How then can anyone oppose the transfer of all power in the state to the Soviets? Such opposition means nothing but renouncing democracy. It means no more, no less than imposing on the people a government which admittedly can neither come into being nor hold its ground democratically as a result of truly free, truly popular elections. Likewise, we know from the Second Congress video, the Bolsheviks seized power ostensibly in the name of the Soviet government and for its protection against counter-revolution. As the Bolshevik resolution approved at the Northern Congress put it, the nation can be saved only by the immediate transfer of all power into the hands of the organs of revolution, the Soviets, at the center and in the provinces. The hour has struck when only by a decisive and unanimous move of all the Soviets can the country and their revolution be saved. During the October Revolution, the messages to this effect are innumerable. For example, Trotsky reported on the eve of the event, all power to the Soviets. This is our slogan. In the days ahead, while the All-Russian Congress of Soviets is in session, this slogan must be put into effect. And as Lenin declared at the Second Congress itself, all power in the locality shall pass to the Soviets, which must guarantee genuine revolutionary order. All this to say, the Soviets were viewed as the heart of the revolution. Within them, the workers expressed their genuine will through free elections. The Bolsheviks then seized power in their name. Would they get the power they were promised? Firstly, recall how on the national level, the Congress of Soviets was confirmed as a sort of legislature. Thereby, ostensibly, the Soviet was empowered. However, the Soviet never took up this position in practice. Whereas Soviet power had been interpreted as installing the Soviet as the new executive, at the Second Congress, the Bolsheviks didn't do this, instead creating a separate all-Bolshevik government. They also refused to implement the Congress's unanimous first decree, which mandated a coalition. On this point, after the Railway Men's Union mediated a coalition agreement, Lenin reneged. If there is a split, let there be one. If they have their majority, let them take power in the CEC and act, but we'll go to the sailors. It is necessary to make arrests, and we will. And let them talk about horrors of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The Vichelites shall be arrested. Let them scream about arrests. Our slogan now, no agreements. For a homogenous Bolshevik government. Essentially, he was willing to go against the Soviet, even to use the military to shut it down by force. For a practical example, consider that the Soviet executive's old newspaper had to be recreated nine times in the month of November alone because the Bolsheviks kept forcefully shutting it down and arresting its members. How do we square the Soviet government suppressing its own Soviet? Effectively, this was purposeful antagonism, 
because it would make the popular coalition idea impossible to implement. It divided the other parties, and also sabotaged the opposition within Lenin's own party. The Bolsheviks could have easily not done this. If they hadn't, they would have had greater cooperation with their government. Regardless, the Soviet executive in practice became weaker under Lenin's government than even under the provisional government. So in this sense, we see the Soviet power as secondary from the start. But the Congress isn't the focus today. What about the backbone of the Soviet system? Those individual Soviets themselves, which were supposed to govern on the local level. How did power pass to them? The first phase began that autumn, with the turn of events ushering in much enthusiasm. The Soviet movement took to the factories, where workers were encouraged to seize control. In addition to the emerging class consciousness, there emerged a strong sense of localism, or this idea of workers taking matters into their own hands for their communities and factories. They instituted factory democracy, looking to the Bolsheviks to remove the capitalist hindrances and then help production flourish. As news trickled out of the capital of some sort of seizure of power, many Bolshevik-led Soviets seized power in towns and provinces as well, but often in conjunction with the other parties. Many non-Bolshevik-controlled Soviets also did so. The Bolsheviks weren't synonymous with Soviet government yet, nor was it entirely clear who had seized power or what it would lead to. Regardless, by the Bolsheviks' own best estimates, in late 1917, no more than a third of the country was represented by Soviets, and not all Soviets were totally empowered to govern. At best, it was a confused mess of Soviets, Dumas, Vyemtsvas, peasant assemblies, and various bodies fighting for legitimacy in every province. While they had seized the capital, the Bolshevik revolution spread highly unevenly. It would be a hard-fought process. This was later euphemistically dubbed the Triumphal March of Soviet Power. But perhaps it might be better said that there was actually hundreds of marches going on, revolutions in every village, of peasants seizing land, fighting the old establishments, and each other. It would be far from triumphant. First, those Dumas and city councils had to go, even though they had been elected on universal suffrage and were in many cases well-functioning. Often they were headed by members of other parties, and also, they were open to bourgeois elements. In the short term, their disintegration helped the Bolsheviks consolidate, but this also proved ruinous. By their own admission, the Bolsheviks didn't really have the skilled personnel to organize effective replacements. So in practice, this might mean removing any semblance of city governance, causing economic ruin and lawlessness. Also, the replacement was often less democratic. Rather than a city-wide assembly, elected by universal, direct, and secret ballot, the replacement might be a closed body, only open to a portion of the population, which might include indirectly elected elements, and which may or may not have secret ballot. Next, across the countryside, the Bolsheviks gained support with promises to end all privilege, to topple the unjust social order, and most of all, to give the land to the peasants. This was the overwhelming desire, and as early as the February Revolution, the peasants had already begun to take matters into their own hands. This grew increasingly retributive, with quasi-socialist and Christian undertones. Seizing the land beget a wave of violence against the landowners, then just violence in general. The Bolsheviks by no means invented this violence, but after October, they chose to legitimize it. Their policy was to endorse and encourage the violence to rally mass support under new language of class conflict, channeling this tendency into what was later known as the Red Terror. As Lenin wrote in December, War to the death against the rich and their hangers-on, the bourgeois intellectuals, war on the rogues, the idlers, and the rowdies. Clean the land of Russia of all vermin, of fleas, the rogues, of bugs, the rich, and so on and so forth. And war against the rich indeed proceeded, but at the same time, creating chaos in general. Mob violence turned into witch hunting and massacres, sometimes along ethnic and social lines. Adding to this were decrees like the Socialist Fatherland in danger. Although issued in regards to the German advance, its final point essentially saying that anyone deemed an enemy should be immediately killed could in practice be used to terrorize almost anyone. Likewise, in the name of war against privilege, looting and plundering intensified not just raiding the bourgeoisie, but raiding all over. As Maxim Gorky wrote in March, No doubt history will tell of this process of Russia's self-robbery with the greatest inspiration. Everything which can be plundered is plundered. Everything which can be sold is sold. In Theodosia, the soldiers even traffic in people. And whereas this was ostensibly to redistribute the wealth, in practice, looting was often carried out by local Bolshevik chiefs and gangs who pocketed the wealth themselves. 
Therefore, critics of the regime accused the Bolsheviks of stirring up uncontrolled chaos and violence, the fabled Pugachovshina. For many socialists, it was not that they were against the idea, but the fact that the Bolsheviks had seemingly exacerbated violence with no rhyme or reason, and that Bolshevik chiefs were taking advantage of the chaos to steal riches themselves, even if that meant terrorizing their own proletariat. And actually, Lenin later admitted they had a point. The chaotic seizures after October had partially been a mistake. They had caused total disorder. Thus the phase of optimism faded with the winter. The second phase was growing disillusion. The Bolsheviks had a fairly large support base initially, but with chaos in the countryside, economic decline, and capriciousness and violence from Bolshevik chiefs, this goodwill began to reverse. While they had gained the soldier demographic by their promises to end the war, as soldiers haphazardly demobilized, they went from concentrated radical constituencies to dispersed across the country, and usually once reabsorbed, they came to identify with their village's concerns more than Bolshevik concerns. Many of these soldiers, later called the Bagmen, formed armed gangs and seized trains, setting up businesses selling food to the cities. Regardless, the sudden reorientation of the military, especially after Sovnarkom ordered all military production cut that December, broke the economy even further. The Bolshevik response was to centralize production to the state and party. The very worker committees, which had been a hotbed for generating Bolshevik support, were labeled as anarchic and syndicalistic. Bans were imposed on strikes, unions, and organizing. Reforms were reversed. The eight-hour workday abandoned where needed. The committees were gradually replaced by officers with dictatorial mandates. Regardless of if this would prove effective, the workers still perceived it as destructive. They had been stirred up for years that workplace democracy was the answer. Now this was being reversed. After all, did Lenin not say only a couple months ago? Workers and peasants, working and exploited people, you yourselves must set to work to take account of and control the production and distribution of products. This, and this alone, is the road to the victory of socialism, the only guarantee of its victory. And the alternative didn't seem any better. The central leadership proved chaotic and uninformed. Even in Petrograd, the industrial unemployment neared 60%. Essentially, they had promised everything and anything to the workers, but were now discovering how impossible that would be, their performance ending up worse than the old government. The urban population also just declined in general. Collapse of industry sent workers back to the countryside, and general mortality increased. All this to say, the Bolsheviks were bound to lose popularity overall, just from the general crises that transpired, which were blamed on their tactics or mismanagement. As all this was unfolding, the Soviets began to hold elections as before. This third phase, called the Periodishka, was a truly unique, almost quixotic time of multi-party politics in Soviet Russia, albeit fleeting. In general, the elections became more restricted. Property classes lost their voting rights entirely, as per Lenin's idea of proletarian democracy. But in practice, even some proletarians couldn't vote. Soviets were sometimes packed with reserve seats for Bolshevik-created organizations, the share of popularly elected seats falling dramatically. They changed election laws, and some even abolished voting entirely. This was jarring, as during 1917, the Bolsheviks had constantly rallied for frequent elections and the right of recall as a central principle of Soviet democracy. As Lenin said, no elective institution or representative assembly can be regarded as being truly democratic and really representative of the people's will unless the elector's right to recall those elected is accepted and exercised. The idea being, the Soviet should always be an up-to-date reflection of the people's will. And since the Bolsheviks were gaining in support at that time, they obviously would want re-elections to gain more seats. But in 1918, this attitude completely reversed. Now they prevented recalls and new elections at all costs delaying them for five, six, even seven months. But the dam began to break that spring. And here's the problem. The other parties started actually winning. In European Russia, which is where Soviet power actually existed, aside from the two big cities, the Bolsheviks lost virtually every single provincial capital where elections were held, to the Menshevik SRs and others. Sometimes the opposition jumped to 90% of the seats. The fact that oppositionists were still able to win in these circumstances shows their growing support and the Bolshevik inability yet to institute authority countrywide. How did the Bolsheviks respond? Where able, they set to bypassing these Soviets, pushing them in line, or seizing them by force. One of the most daring opposition comebacks was in the major industrial complex of Sarmovo around Nizhny Novgorod. Here the Bolsheviks actually cooperated with the industrialists, only adding to the tensions. 
mass strikes broke out, primarily in response to abuses by the Red Guards, forcing the Bolsheviks to relent to elections that spring. This led to an opposition victory, but the old government refused to step down. It later was discovered that half the money raised by the Bolsheviks had apparently gone missing. Naturally, the old Bolshevik government didn't want to step down and be tried for embezzlement. Envoys from Moscow supported this refusal to hand off power. So here, the city responded by forming a rival workers' conference. But on the scheduled day of opening, the Bolsheviks declared martial law, occupied the major buildings, installed machine guns in the streets, and fired on demonstrators. The Bolshevik report of the incident will later state that they had fired some shots into the air, and five people turned out to be wounded, which the opposition ran with given how ridiculous that sounded. The shooting sparked a general strike, and the workers' conference was eventually carried out at a nearby factory under armed protection. The Bolsheviks responded with merciless measures against counter-revolution, meaning mass searches, arrests, and shootings. Much later, after the situation spiraled further, Lenin in a telegram to the provincial Soviet said, we must exert all our efforts, form a troika of dictators, immediately impose mass terror, shoot and take away hundreds of prostitutes who solder soldiers, former officers, etc. Peters, the chairman of the Cheka, says that they also have reliable people in Nizhny. It is necessary to act without restraint, mass searches, executions for keeping firearms, mass deportation of the Mensheviks and unreliables. Next, consider Kaluga, where the Bolsheviks seized power in November and disbanded the city's assembly in December. By January, reports from the city spoke of mass strikes, fear of being overthrown by the workers, and here too the Mensheviks had a resurgence auditing the Bolshevik commissars. Several of them were successfully tried for embezzlement. As one witness said, this whole policy of suppressing dissent led to the workers completely turning away from the Soviet. The sessions are attended less and less often. Their desire to have nothing to do with the authorities is obvious. The Bolsheviks responded by arresting the opposition, as well as mass searches to confiscate weapons. When elections were finally held again, and the Bolsheviks still lost, they ordered all dissidents expelled in June. In Kestrama, the Bolshevik executive committee also refused to vacate when they were voted out of office. Continuing to exist on the side and denounce the democratically elected Soviet, the committee declared, We, the Bolsheviks and the left SRs, have composed the city executive committee and have taken power without relying on the majority in the Soviet. Believing that they better embodied Soviet power, the Bolsheviks used the Cheka to dismantle the Soviet here. Martial law was declared, demonstrations banned, and rival deputies arrested or executed. The story played out much the same in Raison and Tver, where after electoral losses in April, the Bolsheviks disbanded both Soviets and declared a dictatorship of the military committee. The martial law orders banned all meetings, established curfews, ordered all inhabitants to register with the authorities within 24 hours, and for all possessors of firearms to be executed, as well as anyone insubordinate. In the factory town of Varekovazueva, where elections to the Soviets were delayed to March because of a worker boycott, one witness said, The mood in the broad working classes is anti-Bolshevik. This was revealed particularly clearly during the new elections to the Soviet. The results for the ruling party turned out to be pitiful. In Tambov, there was a prolonged political drama in taking the city. As a report from a Bolshevik provincial meeting reveals, the party was openly debating on how best to undermine the elected Soviet, with a plan emerging to essentially starve them out financially. It read, Of course we wanted to shake up the old Soviet, but we had to reckon with the hostile attitude of the Tambov population to the Bolsheviks. Then we decided to try another way, to isolate the city Soviet. Petrograd did not send any funds, which finally forced it to recognize the power of the people's commissars. But that wasn't the end of their issues, because after taking power, a feud between the provincial Bolsheviks and the city Bolsheviks broke out, leading to new elections, which they promptly lost. At that point, the provincial government ordered the city Soviet to disband, but the Soviet refused to submit. Instead, it actually called up the Red Guards to defend the Soviet from the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks responded by shelling the city Soviet. All this even caused the local Bolsheviks to then defect to the side of the Soviet against their bosses. After a ceasefire was reached, another election was called, causing the Bolshevik seats to drop even lower. But the soldiers returned and disbanded the Soviet again, proclaiming, The Soviet is disbanded forever. The time has come to establish not the power of the Soviets, but the dictatorship of the revolutionary parties. 
The Soviet then had to retreat to the railway depot, under protection of the armed workers. The situation of back and forth disbandment and skirmishes came to a head in mid-June, when the situation escalated into an all-out uprising. Feuds like the one in Tambov weren't uncommon. These often violent confrontations within the Bolshevik party itself, between various party branches, between cities and provinces, or different government agencies, are yet another factor explaining the Bolshevik defeats. These regional Bolshevik factions often fought to create their own fiefdoms, where they could extort the locals as desired. These were essentially warlords taking advantage of the party name, their level of cooperation with Moscow uncertain. As assemblies fell, warlords and gangs filled the power vacuums. Near Yekaterinburg, for example, Bolshevik commissars came in and seized the best houses and other luxuries for themselves, and spent hundreds of thousands of confiscated rubles. A strike broke out at the local plant over this, and the commissars called in the Red Guards. Fifteen protesters were shot dead that day, while over a dozen more were executed that week. In Samara, two Bolshevik agencies declared war on each other and fought in the streets, causing one of the groups to approach the Mensheviks for an alliance. The confused Mensheviks declined. Hadn't they just been condemned as counter-revolutionaries? Similarly, in Astrahan, the local Bolshevik organization seceded from the central party, citing disgust at how the party's officials terrorized them and their people. The central party responded by denouncing the Astrahan Bolsheviks. Something strange like this happened in Rostov, too, where a violent feud broke out between the Bolshevik military committee and the Bolshevik commissars. Various bands of revolutionary soldiers were declaring each other counter-revolutionary and seizing power from each other, all the while raiding and harassing the local population, leading to these warring bands being nicknamed as Red Hundreds. This led to the local Bolshevik committee and the Mensheviks actually allying against the Bolshevik commissars. To make matters more convoluted, the primitive white movement was also taking shape in the region. According to one report, the Soviet declared it would not comply with the Don government nor the Bolshevik commissars. The situation was so strange that when German soldiers arrived in May, they were greeted warmly by the population. In Saratov, there was a similar situation. Bolshevik majority in October, elections in April. Here, there was mass unrest over the Bolshevik indemnities. They essentially were shaking down the city for protection money, and even took hostages to make them keep paying. When elections were demanded, the Bolsheviks first changed the election laws to make it harder to vote against them. Pro-Bolshevik trade unions were selectively given representation, and the Bolsheviks just flat out ruled that 25 seats needed to be reserved for their side. But even still, the Bolsheviks lost their majority. As the Bolshevik press put it, Hiding under their non-party status, these citizens wholeheartedly voted with the right SRs and the Mensheviks. We must put an end to this. The city became the site of an uprising the following month. Tensions were already high after the Bolsheviks disbanded the Veterans Union. Now, when soldiers were ordered to suppress the opposition, they refused, turning into a rebellion. As far as can be discerned, this uprising was spontaneous and took the party leaders by surprise. With looting and rioting commencing, the local SRs gave support, but the Mensheviks denounced the rebellion, offering to mediate instead. The Bolsheviks laid siege and took the city. There was a mass crackdown with hundreds of arrests and deaths, and although they were relatively neutral in the affair, even the Mensheviks were punished severely. In the city of Izhevsk, one of Russia's most important military production centers, the opposition took control of the Soviet in February. In response, the Bolsheviks ordered Red Guards to raid the parties, confiscate weapons, and arrest leaders. The SR headquarters was bombed. Several deputies were killed or wounded in ambushes, including the Soviet chairman. Arbitrary arrests, executions, beatings, and public whippings of arrested workers were implemented. And then after insisting on a new election in May, the Bolsheviks still lost. All this violence caused the city to fall into decline, and it was swept up in rebellion later that year. But by the Bolsheviks' own reports, the city had been well off economically beforehand, with an abundance of resources. So by their harassing of locals, the Bolsheviks appear to have birthed this opposition in the first place, and in the process of punishing the dissenters, basically sabotaged one of Russia's crucial production centers, just as the civil war was beginning. The severity of all these crackdowns varied by province, but overall they led to the Bolsheviks changing in the eyes of the workers, from the party that harassed the bourgeoisie to harassing them now. In many towns, these struggles became increasingly bloody, especially as hunger and desperation set in. To put it one way, a worker might be a Bolshevik voter in November, a Menshevik in April, and an anarchist in June. 
This was a sort of I told you so moment for the opposition, but they didn't exactly get to bask in being right. As we saw, when the Soviets lost their legitimacy, the workers began to form alternative assemblies, either to safeguard their Soviets or to just replace them anew. This grew into a loose movement of worker deputies, known as the Oponomochini, supported by the opposition parties. This was especially the case in Petrograd, where new assemblies rapidly took shape after the massacre at the Constituent Assembly opening. Here, the Bolsheviks successfully prevented elections to the Petrograd Soviet from occurring until the summer. Not only would most seats have flipped, many seats technically wouldn't exist anymore, given factory closures and evacuations. As Chernov observed, it has gotten to the point where the Bolsheviks have started to worry about their continued dominance of the Petrograd Soviet. In order to keep their majority from melting away, they've had to forbid the recall of deputies and to forbid elections to the Soviet. As a result, these rival assemblies filled the gap, becoming a major institution for organizing workers, communicating grievances, and providing aid. By April, the Bolshevik press began to nervously label the assemblies counter-revolutionary. The Cheka launched a number of raids, and the workers responded with strikes and protests. One of these protests, near Kolpina, was fired upon by Red Guards, resulting in another massacre. Worse, when the city's factories threatened to strike, the local Bolsheviks ordered the workers to be shot at as they exited the factories. And on top of that, this massacre couldn't have come at a worse time. It was the 100th anniversary of Karl Marx's birth. The city had big festivities planned, and they weren't gonna cancel them. The protesting workers from Kolpina had to be dragged out of the Soviet and arrested. As you can imagine, this caused some major unrest, but it really became a problem when even the sailors got upset. To quote one Bolshevik commissar, we have no support. Everywhere, all over, even at the factories and plants, the masses have turned away from us. Another major site for the assembly movement was Tula, the center of Russia's armament industry. As one local Bolshevik put it, a rapid about-face began in the mood of the workers. We were forced to block new elections to the Soviet and even not recognize them where they had taken place not in our favor. The situation became untenable after a Bolshevik officer killed the leader of the railroad workers' militia. When they sought his arrest, he returned with Red Guards and ordered them to fire upon the workers. This fiasco caused the Bolsheviks to disband the city Soviet soon after, and so Tula also formed a workers' assembly. And fearing the Bolsheviks seizing their guns, even declared a universal people's army. That June, the workers' assemblies created in all these cities sent delegates to Moscow to prepare for an all-Russian workers' congress. This looked really bad to the Bolsheviks. They operated Soviets in a Soviet Congress, while there now appeared to be rival Soviets in a rival Soviet Congress. Horrified by all this, they ordered all the worker delegates in Moscow arrested, and the next day, the opposition was expelled completely from the Soviet executive. Nothing like this had ever been done before. It was throwing out an entire chunk of the people's government. There was no legal basis. And so this became the last nail in the coffin for the Soviet itself. The government didn't even bother sending decrees to them anymore, and the seeds were planted for a rebellion. You may be wondering, why didn't the opposition overthrow the Bolsheviks then? The first problem is, rather than unite, these events divided the already divided opposition even more. The party leaders clung to a sense of legality at first, of not wanting to fight violence with violence. They wanted to avoid a civil war at all costs. And as all this was going on, the nascent white movement was developing, consisting of anti-socialists and monarchists, which would then become their ally. And so the Mensheviks struggled with this. Should they ally with the whites against the Bolsheviks? With the Bolsheviks against the whites? They certainly couldn't tolerate actual czarists gaining power. This caused the parties to schism in two once more. The rightmost wings, called activists, believed it was now time for armed struggle against the Bolsheviks, and often accepted the unholy alliance in the name of fighting a common enemy. But most of the Mensheviks refused this. Martov and Dan led a group still believing in peaceful, legal opposition to the Bolsheviks, explicitly banning armed struggle, believing that if they allied with rightists, that would only play into the Bolshevik propaganda. When rebellions broke out, the Mensheviks went so far as to denounce them. Often I see an argument that the Bolsheviks simply must have had the overwhelming mass support, and that explains why they won. They certainly had support, but in the face of nationwide mass opposition as well, this argument becomes much harder to defend. It might be more accurate to say they benefited from the apathy 
A large portion of the population didn't really support the government, but weren't prepared to go to war over it either. They were worried about getting food on the table, not going on an offensive. This is also why rebellions most often broke out when the Bolsheviks came to them. There was an appreciable withdrawal from politics in general, as those disillusioned with the course of events gave up trying. Party organizations declined overall. In fact, even the Bolsheviks experienced this. Thereby, the number of people participating in this triumphant democracy reached a new low in 1918, both in general and as a percent of the proletariat. It would be difficult for the average person to even gauge what was going on. Not to mention, the Bolsheviks held state power. They had armies, commissars, the Cheka. The opposition was on the back foot. Thus, time and time again, while the workers of a city might be anti-Bolshevik, they often lacked the arms themselves to do much about it. They hesitated to rise up, nor ally with the counter-revolution. Hence, the opposition fell apart, and the Bolsheviks could divide and conquer. But this was not always the case. After those violent crackdowns around the Volga, this catalyzed a whole regional uprising in June. Here a new government was declared, the Committee for the Constituent Assembly, or Kamuch for short. They absorbed the various workers' militias being formed, creating a unified people's army, and they restored universal suffrage in the local assemblies. This wasn't just a strike anymore, it was an all-out war. Two rival socialist governments. Throughout all this, we see a pattern. The workers initially using the Soviet and voting as they desired. The Bolsheviks cracking down on the Soviets when unhappy with the results. The workers attempting to defend their Soviets or make new ones, leading to further crackdown and disbandment of elections. And when elections stopped functioning, the recourse became violence. In this manner, the Bolsheviks catalyzed a full-fledged civil war. Some sort of war was likely inevitable. In fact, the Bolsheviks welcomed one. But by their actions, they evidently made it much worse. And not just a civil war of reds versus white, but between various shades of red, of socialists versus socialists, and the Bolsheviks against the Soviets. Throughout all this, the Bolsheviks justified their crackdowns by arguing that the opposition were all counter-revolutionary, or that the Soviets weren't genuine anymore. Firstly, it hopefully goes without saying, but to denounce the data only because it disagrees with you would be motivated reasoning. And as we saw, mass opposition largely developed organically, parallel to whatever the parties were doing, in some cases, even surprising or hurting them. Of course, the other parties stood to benefit from people being against the Bolsheviks, and they campaigned in this regard. But it would be unfair to say they caused the discontent in the first place. It was going on in spite of them. Contrary to Bolshevik claims, resistance was often disorganized and leaderless, and in actuality, the opposition was expelled before any major uprisings. With rare exception, the anti-Bolshevik actions were in response to Bolshevik actions, not the other way around. Nor was the opposition corrupting the Soviets somehow. They weren't doing tricks to conceal the will of the voters. It was voters using the Soviets as intended. They just happened to be voting for other parties. Even independent workers were still derisively called counter-revolutionary or tentatively linked to the Mensheviks. Sometimes even Bolsheviks were. Essentially, it was scapegoating. Regardless, the opposition parties weren't a monolith either, especially the Mensheviks, who were more like several parties in a trench coat at this point. Graphing the major factions at the start of 1918, based just on the two big issues of peace and government, would produce something more like this. Martov's faction, for example, which became the majority faction in October 1917, had a similar platform to the Bolsheviks, as well as a commitment to peaceful opposition. It would be fallacious to attribute the more militant minority to the whole. Likewise, it would be just as wrong to uncritically accept any of these buzzwords as fact, based on just what their enemies were saying about them, and that goes both ways. Counter-revolution, as it is generally understood, is resistance to a revolution, particularly to overturn it, but that is often a very subjective assessment. A problem arises when from one perspective, any disagreement feels like subversion. In actuality, None of these parties were opposed to the revolution, nor socialism generally. Rather, they were opposed to how the Bolsheviks were going about it. Nor were they eager to ally with explicit counter-revolutionaries. If anything, their inability to ally did them in. Not to mention the actual whites came back in force only after this. It was arguably the Bolshevik actions and subsequent chaos, which contributed to the white movement even re-emerging on a national level. Despite later mythologizing that the parties were eager to war against the Bolsheviks, the evidence belies the opposite, that they were terrified of civil war, both morally and out of a belief it would doom the revolution. 
Instead, they showed constant vacillation of being unable to attack fellow socialists, at least not until it was too late. For example, throughout this entire period, the SR Central Committee operated a policy of peaceful opposition only and a full ban on cooperation with the bourgeois parties. It was only after the events of this video, at the 8th Party Congress in May, that they began to sober up to the idea of fighting back, leading to many joining the revolts in the summer of 1918. And even still, many refused, clinging to this perhaps quixotic belief that they couldn't fight violence with violence, that the Bolsheviks had to be displaced by peaceful means. This isn't to say the opposition were paragons of democracy either. Rather, this is all to point out that they cannot be hastily written off as simply counter-revolutionary. The Bolsheviks' success, in part, was because they weren't. The Bolsheviks had come to power on a promise of giving all power to the Soviets, but they quickly discovered just what that would entail. To give the Soviets power meant giving them the power to choose. In the chaos of 1918, the Soviets remained truly revolutionary centers, both for and against Bolshevik rule. In some provinces, they developed into genuinely local self-governance. For the Bolsheviks, the Soviets had served well in seizing the country, but now they were impeding governance, and they were rallying opposition. The other parties capitalized on a wave of working-class discontent and began to achieve victories in the Soviets. Thus, the Bolsheviks reached a crossroads. To stay true to Soviet democracy and respect the results, or to stay in power and destroy the Soviets. It was hard to accept that the party of the revolution, the vanguard, had lost worker support. All the more easier to destroy the evidence. And so they cracked down on the Soviets, the very Soviets they claimed to represent. And in response, locals turned toward violence, building to a far more destructive civil war. It was framed as red versus white, workers versus exploiters, freedom versus tyranny, us versus them, concealing a much more nuanced topography. As the specter of counter-revolution haunted the opposition, they still believed that they could oust the Bolsheviks in the next election. But the next election became more and more just a fantasy.